name is Arnold Rutkus. Um, I'm a landscape designer by trade currently. Um, I went to school many, many years ago uh, for art. I have a master's of fine arts in sculpture um, and, a, and a minor in printmaking. And uh, it's something I always kind of dive back into in downtimes and whatnot. So, you know, the artistic background is something that I, that I continuously draw on. Um, I grew up in Connecticut, um, you know, enjoyed traipsing through the woods up there. It's just a fantastic place to grow up as a kid. Um, did see kind of the uh, kind of the, the bad side of that too with development getting into our neighborhood. It used to be all old farmland with the stone walls and whatnot and you know finding old uh, farm tools in the woods was always kind of a fun thing. But as as the neighborhood grew and you know obviously with population growth, um, you know just the, the woods became smaller and smaller. Um, <clears throat> found my way down here to Florida um, just by chance. I've lived in a variety of different places but uh, um, always kind of harken back to that time, you know, formative time in the woods, um, just that really kind of solidified my approach to, uh, to what I do now. Um, and the title of the lecture is, is Formed with Nature in Mind, and the whole idea behind that kind of grew out of just not really knowing what to talk about. Um, and once I sat and actually just kind of just felt, you know, a, a reason to, to discuss things, it just, just kind of emerged. So, um, we're all formed with nature in mind if you think about it. Um, the environment is part of us, it penetrates us. We interface and interact with it um, in many, many ways. Um, and uh, you know, I think one of the best things about it is that you know, if you observe nature, you can learn so much from it. And so this first slide, a very interesting uh, field trip that I took, this is actually in Alabama, on the Georgia-Alabama border, but this plant does exist down here in Florida. And I just saw a Facebook post about this from one of my favorite posters, Floyd Griffith. Griffith. Um, it's a uh, bladderwort. And um, it basically is a plant that lives in water. Um, it's carnivorous, which is kind of a cool thing too. Um, it eats very small things. So think about this. It's not like a pitcher plant or anything big, but it eats through its kind of roots. So it has a little valve down there that allows uh, microorganisms to kind of like go in and out and then it just trap door fires off kind of like a Venus flytrap um, and then digest the food. But the beauty of this is that this just happened in this location. So you, what you have here is you've got a scree field, slight pooling of water that's seeping out of the woods and then it's sitting on basically a bedrock of granite, you know, yet these plants are able to thrive in that location. So. So I look at things like this, love, you know, interacting with them, just exploring them, but I learn from this. And so, you know, the whole idea um, is to try to bring some of this back into, you know, our landscapes. And so um, you can do something similar to this on a smaller scale in a, in a home setting, if you like, um, or on a larger scale and, and, and create, you know, large, vast meadows like this. Um, but more, a lot of inspiration I get from, from little little in, uh, interactions like this. So <clears throat> creating a sense of place is really important. So no matter what your inspiration is, it's, it's important to know where you are in the world. Um, and in gardens, you know, you create a, uh, uh, a sense of a certain place and time, uh, whether it's seasonal or, um, you know, basically just defined specifically by your, by your location. Um, sun exposure, soil type, proximity to water, salt versus fresh, all these things will impact the outcome of whatever you're trying to do. Uh, as many of us know, you know, we love these plants, we bring them home, but if we don't put them in the right place, they're not going to thrive. Um, soil type, you know, very important down here, especially you go from sandy soils to clay soils. Um, you know, some soils hold moisture better than others. And then if you have the shade of an oak tree, you know, you have a little microclimate there. So, um, there's also the aesthetics aspect of that and, you know, not overcrowding, you know, wherever it is you're, you're creating this, this place and this space, so. We like to, uh, when we do our uh, projects, our design projects, we do assessments of, of the site. And so it's important to have things like a schematic, um, how large or small is the area you'd like to do? Will it be a water feature, dry creek bed, uh, or it consist of plants uh, and other materials only? Is there a certain look you wanted to have? Do you like European gardens? You know, you can do a native plantings with, you know, kind of a European aesthetic if you like to do that kind of thing, or just go completely, you know, wild Florida uh, and, and go all native, which is really fun. Uh, water management, you know, uh, via rain garden, these are very viable things. 
Um, also adding more nature back into your landscape. You know, with new developments these days, they're clearing the entire job site, taking the soil and everything out of there, and they're putting back minimal planting. So really important to bring habitat uh, features back into a landscape. And some of the auction plants are a great example of how you could do that. The beautyberry, the rouge plant, uh, all those are just very simple ways you can really build back uh, that, that ecology into a site. Picture, do you see a skipper butterfly and a liatris? I have little notations here, but uh, I'll try to mention some of these things as we're going along. So this is an example of a, a schematic that we typically use. It's just a survey that you get from the realty company, but it's a really good uh, kind of uh, base format that you can use when you're assessing your own garden. It gives you the location kind of cardinal points. It gives you measurements, uh, et cetera. And you can really get a sense of scale just by looking at this. Um, and uh, you know, we recommend keeping organic matter kind of away from the base of the house uh, these days, just because that tends to trap moisture. It also brings insects too close to the house. Uh, using materials like sand or shell is really a good idea, or you can use gravel, that kind of thing. So two to three foot buffer is really, really what we recommend. You can also use uh, pine straw over sand if you like to do that. Um, but I like to use these as worksheets. So I'll copy two or three of these and just take notes and just use them as like a little worksheet and whatnot. So uh, just really effective that way. Um, it's also good if you're trying to shop this to your uh, HOA or your neighbors. They're curious about what you're doing. You say, hey, look, you know, I've got, this is where I'm working and this is the scale. It's not going to be too big. This tree's not going to be in your property, all that kind of stuff. Because we're all, you know, cheek to jowl with, each other these days, and it's really important not to overstep, uh, you know, your bounds. Even though we get excited about plants and want to do that sometimes. So here's an example plan. I'm just trying to go through these pretty quickly, but I just want to show you some of, some of the process of how we do these things. So it's a pretty good visual of a typical landscape plan we do. You can see there's a network of pathways there. Uh, the building is to the left, and then there are some existing plants that these beds were developed around. But I like pathways because it subdivides the space. Uh, it allows for you to see things through, you know, different little uh, vignettes or viewpoints. Also, uh, it creates kind of like uh, discoveries. So you have opportunities to kind of like walk around things and, and have like aha moments in the landscape. And a good example of that is I was walking through the garden this morning and there's a big sand pine uh, right in the middle of it. Um, and so, I'm just kind of cruising around doing my thing, pick, pulling weeds, whatever, eating some uh, things like, you know, some dotted horse mint or whatever. And so there's a morning dove sitting right on the garden path, just tooting along, you know, doing its thing. And it does a little, you know, fly off, but just so cool to be able to let nature kind of be in the same space that you are, um, but not even know it's there in a sense, uh, which is kind of kind of interesting. So so by by creating these kind of layers uh, of garden areas, you you allow for that. Plus you can also subdivide it based on some of your design ideas. Say you want an edible garden, you know, further away from the house because you don't want to bring rats to the house. So you put that way out in the corner and then your, your wildflowers, your meadows, your kind of special plants are close to the door. So you see those when you walk out the door. So just, just different things. Also it allows uh, stormwater to percolate through um, and it kind of acts like a tributary system or alluvial plain, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's also good for ease of maintenance, which is really, really important. Uh, maintenance kind of finishes landscapes. Uh, we, we design and start them, but uh, the maintenance really finishes them off. So um, this is a really interesting site. Um, did a visit out there. It's the Tampa Bay Estuary and the Rock Ponds. Um, it's kind of Cockroach Bay area or Apollo Beach, if you know that area. And so this, is, this was a, a great field trip we took um, with... Um, a uh, bunch of group of great folks, um, but this kind of see through here, you know, building patterns is really important. Patterns do create the rhythm of your landscape. And so this was all restoration landscape, which is kind of, you know, encouraging. And you can kind of see they've got uh, slash pines kind of work through there. Um, and then, you know, various plants, you know, some, some dog fennel and some, some kind of wild scrubby things, a lot of grasses. They did some seeding out here as well. Uh, but a lot of this is just, uh, you know, volunteers from neighboring landscapes that kind of migrate in. So you're basically just, you know, allowing nature to kind of like do its, you know, do its thing where it just creates these kind of like uh, waves of plants that work through the landscape, come and go and, and whatnot. So um, to recreate something like this, if you really wanted to go like with a nice native look, 
you know, pick a couple of good specimen trees. Uh, slash pine's a great one just because it's it's one of the best, I think, for, for this area. Um, something substantial like that, and then underplant it with grasses, and then pick one or two perennials, and there it is. And then you'll have other things show up in your landscape, which is really kind of great. So I'll just repeat this, and it's kind of one of those things, you know, patterns do create the rhythm. Um, in this garden, this is uh, up in the villages, and uh, we did a field trip up there with our fan group. And you've got low growing natives like Georgia basil, um, coonties, and uh, some wild blueberries. There's some pityopsis up to the top that kind of, you know, arcs up in that way. And then you have uh, wild coffees, and then I think there's a Marlbury up to the left, and the Simpson stopper at the end right there. So you can kind of see the way it's organized. It's it's kind of again organized like a stream stream bed or you know uh, a forest path. Um, and this is in a suburban you know landscape that you know was highly regulated HOA. They worked really hard to allow themselves to do this because they were very passionate about natives. And so um, you know they mulch the path annually. Um, and they work really hard to create kind of a neat look. So again, you can do these things with native plants in highly restrictive areas if you try to work with the aesthetics and not let it get too out of hand. And of course, it's it's one of those things, you know, I, I love to let a plant go through its full breadth and width of growth and get rangy and do all kinds of crazy things, go to seed. A lot of times people don't like the way that looks, unfortunately, and uh, we have to kind of dial that back when you're, when you're in these situations. But you could probably do a little something around the backyard and you know create some wild space back there. Again, you know the patterns do create the rhythm. It's uh, you know this is a, a residential project that I designed up in uh, Tarpon Springs, and it's right on the Antelope River. So you've got literally it's surrounded by salt water, but it, this is a little kind of sheltered area in front of the house that they wanted to do. Uh, they've got a rain garden kind of closer to the windows right there, but they wanted a pathway that that just kind of like you know, merged the house with the landscape. So came up with this plant palette, um, love grass, pityopsis, sunshine mimosa, rosin flower, and a few other random things in there. And then the, the owner has done a great job maintaining the, the sunshine mimosa along the pathway because that can tend, have a tendency to overgrow and get a little crazy, but it's done this amazing thing out there where it, it, the mimosa is over the entire yard now, and it's literally become the dominant turf. So there's no turf grass in this location. It's all sunshine mimosa. And then you have these islands of plantings. So, and the, the love grass comes and goes. It's one of those that, that, that is literally just moves around the garden. Um, and then the pediopsis, which is this kind of rangy one here. It's really great. It blooms kind of late season, late summer season into the fall. And then they just, they just cut that back. So the maintenance on this is very easy, very, very low uh, impact on them. And they get to enjoy this uh, year round. So um, just creates a nice sense of wholeness uh, to the space. Let's do it again. Here, click. There we go. Uh, coastal Cottage Garden. Again, I referenced kind of, you know, uh, aesthetics, style. And so cottage gardening, very popular, obviously. It's one of those kind of buzzwords you hear a lot. But how do you do it down here in Florida? Um, this is a perfect example. This is in Dunedin. This is a small, tight space. Uh, there is an HOA here, but they're very, they, they work a lot together to, to allow people to do kind of fun, creative things. Um, and the owner does a great job uh, with the maintenance. She has someone come in and kind of clear some of the larger things, uh, branches and stuff, but she does the clipping on the plants and really keeps things looking good. And so uh, I'm kind of click through and yeah, here we go. Here's some labels on some things. And so, you know, in the front here, we've got sand cord grass. So that to me is one of the best, most durable. This is a south facing edge right here, right at the bottom of the screen. Uh, and so that's just, you know, fantastic kind of textural plant. Um, it only gets about three or so feet tall. It just kind of fountains over. So it just has a great appearance next to it. And then on the other side of the gate, there are dwarf salt bush. And I love this plant because it's, it's adaptable. It's one of these things we can use it in a number of different ways. If you let it go more natural, it has a little bit more of an open look as a shrub, but you can definitely uh, clip it very tightly like this, almost like a boxwood. So kind of gets into that cottage garden uh, aesthetic. Uh, they have an olive tree back here. And then to the right of that is a silver buttonwood, which has similar foliage. So again, you're, you're using some native, native and non-natives and they're kind of relating a little bit in terms of an aesthetic, a Mediterranean look. Um, 
back here they've got some some uh, rosemary but then up against the house they have a marlberry which allows the fragrance to kind of get into a screen and porch there so really taking advantage of working in a small space like this um, but getting maximum results and uh, there is a there's actually a swale behind all this to the left that goes down about three feet so that's a stormwater swale that is lightly planted i would call it there's not a lot in there so it allows for that functionality uh, of the stormwater coming off the buildings and off the paving getting in there and, and perking out and getting out into wherever it's got to go before it goes to the uh the ocean waters so another example of, of a more formal type look um this is a uh, a garden that's in saint petersburg florida i didn't design this but i'm always riding around looking for inspiration kind of like that first picture where see something and then just try to just try to gel or vibe with that and you know draw inspiration from that so in the front here is right along the street we've got a uh, beach creeper or in Bernodia uh, literalis which has a beautiful pink flower I may have a picture of that later I think but this is one of my favorites it's kind of a semi-succulent uh, plant it gets to about foot and a half to three feet tall depending upon how you treat it this obviously is clipped very tightly and kind of sculpted around the stones and around the irrigation uh, and there's some drainage out here as well. Very drought tolerant once it's established, salt tolerant as well. Um, and it's a great framework for the rest of the garden, it kind of like creates this, this frame through which you, you view the rest of the garden. Obviously some palm trees there, they have some necklace pod and a few other natives tucked in here, here and there, some native grasses. But by using a palette of similar plants from a similar you know, in, uh, ecosystem or environmental area, you can create kind of a look almost instantaneously. You don't have to work that hard. Um, I think the issue a lot of folks have is they try to pull from so many different, you know, regions and, and uh, you know, habitats and whatever and try to put it all together um, and make a native garden, you know, which is, is okay, but I think it's important to like limit your palette sometimes and then you can always add to that. So uh, this is a good example of that kind of, you know, and it, it creates a much more formal style, I think too, so. And this is one of the one of my designs. This is in uh, Old Northeast, St. Pete, and this is definitely kind of more wild, kind of like creative, uh, playing with the plants really. Um, but there's structure to it as well. So front uh, and center is a cocoa plum, horizontal cocoa plum. Those have gotten about three feet tall, but they keep them clipped so you can see over them. So it's really important in in urban and suburban areas. We have lines of sight near the streets, and for safety, it's it's one of these high priority things. Just have to think about that. Um, but the horizontal cocoa plum is great because you can you can nail it down, foot and a half tall, that you know the whole length and run of it, and it'll be fine. It's perfectly happy with that. So it's great for coastal gardens, but it does well inland as well. Has an edible fruit, which is uh, kind of tasty. Kind of tastes a little bit like a fig, not too bad. Um, next uh, next to that, I've got some. Uh, I think there's some yeah, there's some some uh, perennial peanuts, whatever. And then beyond that, there's a uh, rosin flower, and then you've got muley grass in the back, which is really showing its, uh, its colors off. And this is, you know, a good example, again, limited palette, but at the same time, kind of letting the plants do their thing and, and get a little crazy too. There's some sunflowers and some beach verbenas in there as well. Um, kind of more of a painterly or artistic uh, effect. So. You can also use plants in, a, in ways that, you know, uh, kind of buffer landscapes or buffer the environment even. And so this is a garden, that, uh, another one in St. Pete, where the, uh, you know, it's a lot of shade here, a, lot, a couple of oak trees that really drop a heavy leaf load a couple times a year. So the owner was looking for a way to like, you know, kind of mitigate that a little bit. So I suggested the hammock twin flower, and then they're able to let some of the leaves drop into the twin flowers, but also blow leaves behind them and let them basically compost into the landscape. Um, this is, again, a lovingly kind of uh, curated garden, I would call it, by the homeowner. Does a great job with this. This twin flower, hammock twin flower, is planted in the medians as well, and it runs the full length and breadth of the property. It just It's a nice alternative to, say, the uh, Asiatic jasmines and those types of plants. Um, has a blue flower. It's also a larval host plant. Uh, for butterfly species. So just multi-purpose. Uh, I've heard a funny thing today with a client that uh, I was talking to, you know, she was talking about her wife and she's, she says, hey, you know, you know, she's, she says she wants to put a plant, put a tree in here, but it has to work. And I'm like, what do you mean it has to work? 
it's got to do something. This tree has to do something. So, so the more function you can have in your plant material, I think the, the more interesting it can be, but also you're doing much more with your plants uh, when you can kind of incorporate some of these into your landscape. So just kind of a funny, funny little, funny little anecdote there. I'm the only one that it's, it's okay. <laughs> All right, so getting to what we have to deal with uh, uh, a lot on a regular basis, water, um, and talking about how to maybe bring some water features uh, or aspects into your, into your landscapes. It's just wonderful, you know, to hear the sound of water. It's very soothing, very calming. Going to the beach is obviously great. We're down, blessed down here in Florida, um, even the freshwater areas. This is a pathway out in, um, um, let's see, where the heck is this? This is Tarpon Springs. I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought there for a second. But this is one of the coastal wetlands out here, right next to a beach. And uh, that's my wife walking into the distance. And it's about six inches of, of brown water there. So that's all the tannins from the uh, composting leaves and whatnot. But this type of uh, seasonal pooling and puddling uh, is something we have to deal with down here in Florida. My backyard basically has, uh, you know, erosion rings around it, you know, and, and, you know, the water flowing through there. It's literally like uh, a stormwater pond. So, you know, when we get a gully washer of a storm, this occurs in our backyard, but then it subsides, it goes away. So um, it's interesting to think about, you know, uh, the flow of water on a site, what, it, what it's doing, where it wants to go in your landscape. And you can learn from that, you know, just by watching, you know, the, the rainwater when it falls down. So we're basically surrounded by water. These coastal landscapes are, are very durable, uh, you know, with the plant material they have. This is a picture of some mangroves here over by Gandhi Bridge. Um, I did a little trash picking here, uh, you know, when I took the picture. So there's no trash in the picture because I picked the trash up, which is just amazing. Uh, and that was just one small area. Actually, there's a piece of trash right in the middle of that picture. I forgot that one. But, but you know, th this is something too, like, you know, you go to these, go to the beach and just look down and don't look anywhere else. You'll see trash everywhere. It's just amazing. Um, I filled up, you know, uh, three 15 gallon buckets and then, you know, emptied those out and filled them up again. And I didn't get everything here, but, uh, you know, that's just part and parcel of what we're dealing with. Um, but, you know, the, the salt water issues we have to deal with when we live on the coast, uh, saline soils, occasional flooding, salt spray, et cetera. A lot of these plants that I just mentioned are very adapted to these conditions. So, um, you know, it can be very useful to us. We actually can capture some of this water in the form of rain barrels, swales, dry creek beds, and let that passively water the landscape um, through a rain garden or something like that. Um, yeah, nature provides great lessons. So uh, hopefully we can learn from them. So this is a, you know, a nice example of something I saw, you know, I do play golf, unfortunately, or fortunately, you know, it's one of those things I just love to do it. It gets me out in nature, but I always look at what they're doing on the golf course and if they're doing good things or bad things, you know, it's one of those, you know, opportunities for me to, you know, it's literally like walking through a certain kind of park in a way, but, but this is one course that they actually did something interesting here. So I'm using it as an example. It's a dry creek bed. And you notice that um, it has uh, not a straight line shape to it. It's got kind of a bowed sides to, to it as well. And there's a mix of sizes of the aggregate in there. So that's gonna really slow the velocity of the water down. So a simple structure like this, if you had this in a variety of different areas on say golf courses or large manicured landscapes would do so much to trap um, nutrient load before it gets into our stormwater ponds and then on into the Gulf. So this is a really, really good uh, opportunity here, I think, to learn from this. And also you could literally, instead of just having turf grass running right up to it, you could line that with the cord grass or some other type of you know, low shrub in that area, which would, again, soak up a lot of those uh, nutrients and, and whatnot, and some of the water. So we actually trap some of the water in place. Water is always gonna seek its lowest point in the landscape. Um, it's, uh, it's important to slow that velocity. And I think shaping the look is important when you're trying to build a structure like this into your own landscape. So it doesn't so much uh, stand out too much or become an eyesore per se, but, but it's very functional and can kind of work within the aesthetics of what you're doing. It takes practice to do that. It took me 20 years to get to the point that I'm at and I'm still learning. I'm not perfect. And uh, I'm still learning how to do these things and getting inspiration from, from others doing things too. And draw from nature, you know, uh, walking along a creek, you know, look at the way a creek meanders through a woodland. Maybe, maybe draw a little sketch of that and use that as your model. You know, it's, 
you know, um, when we lay out beds, sometimes we lay out a garden hose and just throw it down there. How does that look? Nope, do it again, throw it, throw it down. And then finally you find a shape you like. And, and I think it's the same thing when you're trying to bring these into your own landscape. You have to trial and error a little bit. And it's, it, you know, the first time is not always the perfect, uh, perfect one. So this was kind of a, a sad moment, um, but it was also a good opportunity to do something creative and, and you know, kind of in, in a reclamation, reclamation type way. Uh, the fish kill in St. Pete, y'all obviously know about that from last year. It's horrible, um, just the smell of it alone, but just the loss of life and uh, the impact on our economy and in any number of other ways you want to discuss the just the, just the tragedy of it all. It's just uh, just mind boggling. But you know, uh, there, this was an opportunity to to work on something during that time that actually had a positive impact. So this is a, a client's garden. She she lives right at the right in front of the mouth of of their little inlet here. This is Big Bayou in South St. Pete. She has a sewer drain outlet, you know, a sewer storm outlet right next to this property. So it was constantly washing away what she was trying to do here. And uh, she was really she's really keen on uh, Tampa Bay Watch and. Uh, you know, basically, you know, loves the idea of a coastal reclamation. She she had done some of this, what's called oyster shell bags. I don't know if you know about that stuff, but oyster shell bags, you take a kind of a nylon bag or a mesh bag, fill it with oyster shells, and then you can use that almost like a retaining block or a retaining uh, uh, parcel. The nice thing about that is it's, it's, it's permeable. It allows stormwater to go through it. It traps, you know, uh, debris. It, it does a lot of cool things. Um, so this is the, the fish kill. And we see right here, we've got the uh, oyster shell bags. We used about, I don't know, five or six tons of them. Uh, we had had a nice tool. It was basically a piece of tubular uh, PVC, six inches in diameter, about three feet long. And then these, we would just fill these bags up. We have some marine limestone here too. But she was also like, she had a sloping backyard, kind of just, it fell off. And so she felt like she was losing her yard, you know? So we basically, uh, I laid out a, a line of, drew a line in the sand here and, um, you know, said, we're gonna build build back a bit of a retaining wall system that can vegetate. And um, and then we can backfill that with soils and then plants and mulch. And she literally is reclaiming her, her land this way. So it's basically called a living shoreline when you do this. Uh, this can be done in salt water or fresh water. You know, you can do these kinds of things. I know in fresh water, if you're using oyster shells, maybe it's a little bit of a thing, but there are other products that you can use as well in those situations. And here's a view from that kind of same location of the original picture. You can kind of see what we're doing here, basically creating a, uh, a ramp uh, to go down to the water. And then left and right of that, we're building up the uh, retaining wall. We came up about two and a half feet or so. So really leveled it back up and, and, and gave her back a good portion of the land, but also uh, still gave her the nice soft access because we, we topped everything with sand and then mulch. And then some of the natives here are the cord grass to the right and left. There's some uh, dwarf salt bush in there. And um, I think we actually have some other, some muley grass in here. Yeah, here's a cocoa plum here as well. So, and then, you know, it's great because uh, it's instant impact for her. She, she just gets a lot out of this. She's always back and forth uh, to and from the water. She loves to kayak. So just became a really nice uh, kind of a present for her in a way, you know, to do the landscape. Um, and then edu educational. I really learned a lot doing this. And, uh, you know, it was, it was backbreaking work. Smelled horrible out there the whole time, but you know we got through it and, and did something nice. This is a so go I'll go into a couple of slides where we're just talking about water features, and uh, this is not one of mine, but I've done a couple of like this um, where it basically it's just a simple well, and um, you know they have a reservoir underneath this um, with some type of you know it's either a pond liner or hard liner. And then they surround it with boulders, you know, some gravel in the middle, and then bringing an old stump in is a really nice feature to just naturalize it and uh, give it some character. And then they probably got some moss from the neighboring woods and then added a little grass in here and here and there. But you can imagine doing something like this in a very small, tucked in space. I think the one at Wilcox is, is kind of a nice example of, of this type of, uh, you know, kind of like a well type uh, water feature. And you do get the sound of water as it kind of recirculates. This is more, this is gonna be more of like a larger example. So someone's big backyard um, and uh, clean slate here, just pretty level lawn, um, maybe a little slope to it. And this is the excavation that they have to go through to do this. So this shows kind of like, again, on a larger scale, 
just the process. Um, a lot of times people ask me like, how do you build the pond? How, you know, how does it hold the water? You know, why is it so expensive? And blah, 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 this. And I'm like, hey, well, you know, look, look at what I've got to do here. You know, they had to excavate, I don't know, 10, eight, 10 cubic yards of soil. Then they have to come in with an underlayment of some kind. So it's got to be basically like a soft material that goes underneath the liner. The liner itself, that's huge. Uh, and then not to mention all the stone. So this, a pond on this scale, you know, I've seen, I've been on the installs on some of these larger ones. This is a 15 to $20,000 pond right here when it's all said and done. Smaller scale of this, you can get into two to $3,000. So just talking budget, you know, I know a lot of folks are, you know, it's, it's important. Um, you can also buy kits uh, from different companies that, you know, are pre-made for about $1,000. And then just you buy the materials and everything else and put it together yourself. So there's a lot of options here um, to, to bring the water into your landscape. And then finishing it off is always the key. This is a great example. This is the same pond, but they just, they did it in an entirely naturalistic way. Um, and uh, obviously the stone is, is, you know, kind of like more maybe Northeast or Midwestern um, type rocks, but you could easily do something like this down here in Florida. I had some juncus, I've got some plant list, uh, plant list right here. So this is some of our plants we could use in this location, Bacopa, juncus, uh, cardinal flowers, a great one. I love using that in, uh, in wetland projects and rain gardens. Uh, Hammock twin flower would be nice on the edge, just kind of growing on the edge. Pitcher plants, swamp ferns, um, the bladder warts in the, in the original picture. That's just to name a few. So. It's really, you know, um, a lot of opportunities to, to do these types of things, you know, within your landscape. Show you this little one here again. This is kind of like the typical uh, Florida look, I would say. A lot of folks think that's native Florida. <laughs> and, you know, it's great. It's subtropical. It has a wonderful texture and, and, and color and look, but I don't see a native plant in there, you know, uh, to Florida. This could be it over in Thailand too. I don't remember where I got this picture, but um, but I wanted to show you just the, the layout of the pond because this is a really interesting way to fit something into a corner of your landscape um, and maximize its effect. So this could be facing the front door of your courtyard at home or in the backyard facing the back door. Um, would be great for wildlife too because it would create kind of like a separation. Um, and then you, know, you see it's got a waterfall at the top there. There's a second water course to the right. Um, but it would be great for bird bathing and then add some aquatic plants in there too. So obviously non-native uh, plants, but easily to, uh, to superimpose native plants on there. Got to talk to the right. All right. Um, so here we go. This is, a, this is my project. Um, did this for a friend. She was very passionate about having a water feature for the frogs. So <laughs> I said, okay, I, we can do that. Let's, uh, let's create a, a pond for the frogs. And uh, uh, this is the uh, initial excavation that I did. Pretty much um, kept the same pattern. Um, every All the soil out of the center of the pond was used to build up the rim or the berm, and then also the waterfalls. You kind of see the future waterfalls up to the right, kind of to the back, and then the water return is down at the end over there. So, and uh, excavation took about, I want to say, four, four or five hours to, to do all this and then lay out uh, where things would go. And that's important. When you have a system like the waterfall system, you have to think about your water levels, um, where it is re in relation to the, to the level of a stone or whatever you're putting around the pond. There's going to be subsidence. The pond is going to settle because it's all, you know, rains like crazy down here in Florida. So all these things you have to kind of factor in and, and think about. I did actually use a lot of mulch around this pond, pine straw mulch, and it really seemed to, to keep the things in place really well. So um, scale of that pond is about seven or eight feet across and seven or eight feet wide. So just for reference, I did use some large boulders in there. So got the labor saver out. This is my, my good friend, Zach's uh, from Pitchford Design, used his bobcat, which is really great. So thanks, thanks a bunch, Zach. Uh, appreciate that if you're watching. Um, <clears throat> So, you know, really important to like not break your back when you're doing this. When I was younger, I would hand wrestle these things, but I don't do it. <laughs> I don't do that now. I, I, I rely on machinery and, and hopefully a little, little more uh, of a wiser attitude um, to work. And then this is, again, process of the liner going in. Uh, we definitely added in some gravel. We've got a little bog area that's to the foreground on the left. And then, um, you know, the, the, I did add some sand in here as well. So again, you have to think about filtration when you're doing water features. How are you going to filter the water? Uh, really important. The roots of whatever you put in there will do a little bit of that. 
But if you can create six to eight inches of some kind of substrate in, in the pond itself, that'll really help with microorganisms uh, and to help clear the, keep the pond water clear as well. You can also put in artificial uh, structures that will actually get microorganisms uh, and, and good biology going in a pond as well. And then having the circulating pump is important as well. So that keeps the, the, the pond oxygenated and everything. To the right, we've got the materials I used. Uh, there's some, I don't know, I think that's Missouri stone out to the right. And then to the left is good old Florida limestone. And uh, probably one of my favorite, favorite rocks on the planet, actually. I love that rock. So here's the finished result of the, the waterfall. And um, as you can see, that, you know, it's uh, it basically just kind of almost, you know, creates a little bit of an artificial look with the slabs up there, but just try to dress it up with stone and then plantings around that. Once the plantings grew over this, you don't even see that, that outlet right there. You just hear the sound of the water. So it's, uh, it creates a really nice, uh, you know, calming effect in the garden. And the frogs are there too, I just gotta say. She's, she's so happy about the frogs, it's crazy. <laughs> loves it, loves it. Of the frogs. So. And this is a good example of something that you could do that's maybe a little more, um, not as loud, but it would create that kind of like softer sound of, of water, almost like, you know, water, you know, dripping down after a rainstorm and that kind of thing. And I see a lot of these seep type gardens and like very old Florida gardens, you know, it's, a, it's basically create this in a courtyard, build, build it as part of your wall area. And then you can kind of see that uh, the plants have just patriated themselves into the cracks, nooks and crannies and showed up. But you can also, you know, add your own plants to this as well. Um, basin could be shallow or full of gravel, stone, that kind of thing. Uh, I would highly recommend if you do something like this, mortar it all together, make it as solid as you can. If you get an eight foot stack of stone in your backyard and you lean against it the wrong way, it's going over and who knows? <laughs> Who knows what happens? It's just one of those things. I think safety first when it comes to rocks and stones and hardscapes, really important. I've, I've uh, done it for over 20 years. and I've done lame brain things. I've done really intelligent things with rock. And it's, it's important to like really think it through when you're building things um, and make it, make it last, you know, make it last so you can enjoy it forever. Um, and then those beyond you. Um, obviously, you know, um, you know, so a substructure of block or concrete could be useful. I did do uh, a small pond over in Gulfport for a client that was very similar to this. It's a, it's a pile of stones, but I have a substructure of uh, foundation blocks that's really solid, so it's not going anywhere. Here's a, a kind of a more intimate style. Um, this is for a nature photographer friend who wanted to basically bring songbirds as close as she could to her back windows and doors so she could photograph them. And uh, so we, she wanted to create a bog garden. And so um, this is the excavation right here. This is about six feet from the house. Um, and uh, you know, this is a, in the process. We're starting to add the stone around it. We have a pond liner in there again. But this is the same location, and uh, this will be filled with gravel and then plants to complete it out. But it's uh, it allows all the rainwater that comes off the house to go through the natural stream bed, which she has attached to this. So she has a stream bed that goes about, I'd say, 30 feet down to a swale behind the property, which is highly vegetated. So a lot of a lot of birds and wildlife use that as a corridor, and then they kind of kind of sneak out and come to her little oasis over here, and she takes pictures of them. And she she does very well with her, you know what she what she sees. So this is the finished product right here. Um, and again, it, it kind of disappears into the into the landscape a little bit. Um, but during wet times, rainy season, that fills up, and you really do see a lot more of flowing water. But it's kind of like to the edge. There's some little coffee. There's some spiderwort, uh, blue flag iris, little psycho coffees. I think I mentioned that already, but uh, lobelia, swamp fern, and spider lily, which are great plants for this type of uh, location. And it, it's really close to the house, so it's it's really, really nice feature for her. So now I'll just kind of switch gears a little bit, talk about larger scale versions of this, um, things you might see in you know a, a park or that kind of thing. Uh, I know Moxon Lake probably has a few of these kind of areas where water collects and they're basically a rain garden uh, or a bioswale. And this was done at uh, Ruffner Mountain Nature Preserve in Birmingham. I uh, did a lot of work up there. Um, it's, it's probably one of the best examples to me of, of you know, you know, what you can achieve. There's basically a parking lot right above this that, you know, is, 
is huge. And then you have all the water that comes off the mountain. So it basically goes right through this little uh, wet, you know, stormwater pond and then percolates back down uh, the hill through a series of dry creek beds. It's basically planted with uh, native plants exclusively. We've got um, switchgrasses, different types of um, some evening primrose here. There's uh, button button bush here. Um, and then you can kind of see we use some logs and some organic matter that can just kind of like, as the pond fills up, it kind of, you know, meanders, floats around just like a natural system would do, um, kind of like, you know, stirs it up and then it settles back down. And then all the leaves from the trees drop into this and it just creates a, a really, you know, dense nutrient rich environment for all these plants to thrive in. So um, when you do a, a mixed planting in a swale, I think it's important to have, you know, large, medium and small. So I like to use taller species like bald cypress or river birch, um, sweet bay magnolias, those types of things as my, you know, anchor or foundation plants, and then work other things around those. Um, you know, on the, along the borders of uh, the pathways or, you know, uh, this is next to a parking lot. We used a lot of grasses and uh, perennials and low shrubs and whatnot to frame it all up. And then using aggregate was really key. There's a, there's a uh, again, a dry creek bed that runs right through this. Um, but that aggregate will slow the water down. So it's important to like slow velocity of water, um, you know, uh, in these landscapes to allow uh, particulate matter, heavy metals and stuff to filter out and, you know, be trapped in the landscape. Interesting thing about this site, this was an old dry cleaners uh, facility and dry cleaners back in the day, you know, they threw everything under the sun out into just horribly polluted, uh, polluting industry and just, uh, just, just the forever chemicals we hear about. But this is a way to kind of lock those things in and, and, you know, mitigate some of that. So it turned it into a very nice uh, park um, setting that people can now enjoy. So. so this is a slide showing kind of like a diagram of how we would explain this when we were when we were proposing these projects, people couldn't visualize, well, how do you do that? How do you do a biosoil? It's like, well, you know, the most important thing is to trap the water. So you kind of see all the arrows, you know, uh, leads to the center of the, the biosoil. And then, you know, in the center, you've got the area where it ponds or pools up and the pathways were all made with some kind of a drainable aggregate. So sh down here, we would use shell or, or pea gravel or something like that, or sand even just to allow the, the water and the stuff to percolate through. And then, you know, having some bouldering, having some forest paving, uh, and then surrounding it with plants that would, uh, you know, draw those, the, the moisture, but also the nutrient load out is really, really important. You can see the, the roots will soak up the water and um, and also large, medium, small, again, just reiterating that, you know, that pattern is really important, I think, to have scale and uh, really makes it relatable, I think, um, and, and also fits into the, the surrounding landscape. Here we have a residential garden. This is a cool project. Um, you'll see this if you look at, uh, if you watch Flip My Floor to Yard, you know that show? I probably might have heard of that. Anyway, uh, so this is something that we got into through the fan group. and so. <clears throat> it's a TV show. It's basically like a flip your yard project show. And um, the homeowner was very interested in harvesting rainwater. So we have rain barrels on the property. Um, we also, um, you know, said, hey, let's put a rain garden. In. So we we basically cited this, this uh, in an area that's away from the house. And I think it's important, again, when you put these features in your landscape, think about the effect they're going to have directly to your house. It's really important. So 10 or 15 feet away is the minimum. I would put them away from the house because it's gonna be a pond, you know? So it's, it, that could undermine your foundation and create, create issues and that kind of thing. Um, you can't see the pond because it's behind the berm. And so how do you make the berm the swale? Well, you take soil out of the center where the swale is gonna be, and then you use it along the edges down the downhill side and that creates the berm that holds the, the uh, water back. And so it's, it's borrowing from Peter to pay for Paul basically. Just, using materials on site. You didn't have to bring anything in to do this. The berm is about two feet tall compared to the swale, which is which is about down about a foot and a half uh, below the grade behind it. So um, on the berm, we're using drier, drier or more drought tolerant plants uh, like the uh, horizontal cocoa plum, firebush, um, some coreopsis has gone through its cycle already, so that's not there. Pine straw at all really well. Um, inside the pond, we've used, uh, again, button bush. We've got some sweet bay magnolias there. 
and uh, some juncus and some Takahatchee grass. And, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing this one because it's pretty fresh, the install. So uh, it should be pretty exciting to watch. Um, this next section, I'm kind of just going to be going through different plants and talk a little bit about bringing pollinators into the garden. Something you probably heard a lot. And uh, it's one of those things you can't beat a dead horse enough, I think, with this. It's so important. We're losing so much habitat every day. And we're losing big things. But I think with small things, you can you can bring these uh, these creatures back a little bit more. But also, don't forget about trees. Trees are so important. Trees, you know, the oak tree, I think over 400 species of moths and butterflies alone, larval host on an oak tree. That's astronomical to me. It's amazing. You look at a tree, you barely see anything. You know, you know there's a bird, there's a squirrel. There's so much life in those things. It's, it's just, it's crazy that we cut them down uh, with impunity. Um, so trees are so important. So plant a tree if you can. Shrubs, shrubs are great because they're on a scale that we can manage. They don't overwhelm us. They won't grow over our houses unless they're on steroids, which some of them are. But, you know, things like yokon, firebush, Simpson stoppers, viburnums, they all have a great, uh, you know, benefits. You know, they could be a nectar source, larval food source, uh, berry source like the beauty berries we mentioned earlier. Um, and then the forbs of grasses are wonderful too. And salvias, crown beard, sunflowers, coreopsis, you know, all you know are, would be a wonderful addition to your landscape. And, uh, go through some of the uh, kind of more of a like more of a gallery here, cast of characters, if you will. But these are some of the plants that I love to see in my garden, and I love to introduce to clients. Um, on the left is ageratum, a mist flower. This is a self seeder that is just it blows my mind down here. It it you know, one of them, one plant showed up in my garden, and now it's everywhere. So I pull it out as a weed sometimes, but, you know, at the same time, it's such a beautiful plant. And also, the monarch butterflies absolutely love this. So this is probably one of my favorite monarch uh, nectar plants. Next to it is a cut-leaf coneflower. That gets to about three or four feet tall, so kind of a, a larger type perennial. You could put that in a semi-shade area in your garden and then get those blooms. Great cut flower. Great pollinator plant. To the right of that is Georgia pastor. That's something that's a little more probably, uh, you know, panhandled. It's, you know, obviously with the name Georgia pastor, it's kind of from up that Alabama, Georgia area, but it grows well down here. I know Dr. Hugo grows it. Uh, and uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful plant. And Wilcox does sell it on occasion when they get it. Um, just great for fall color. To the right of that is sneezeweed. And that's again one of my. That and the, and the ageratum, probably my favorites uh, in terms of self seeding, always productive, always happy to see me. You know, I'm just, you know, I pull them out, you know, when I don't want them there. But look at that beautiful sculptural form, just a fantastic looking plant um, and great pollinator uh, tractor. A couple more here, Liatris uh, with a skipper uh, on it. And uh, just fantastic. It, it, you literally, you know, the plant itself is a, is a piece of art to me or a work of art. And then it brings things in like these butterflies and these interesting wasps and bees. To the right is, I think it's a cellophane bee on, on the horse mint. Look at the beautiful structure of the horse mint flower. It just literally looks like a candelabra um, of blooms. To the right of that is uh, Stokes Aster. Again, very, very uh, durable once it's established. And uh, two to three feet tall. It's nice to interplant that with something maybe in the complementary color scheme, like a rosin flower or something. And then uh, yellow passion vine, uh, this one again, I think we, you know, a, a volunteer came into the garden and then this just started climbing up the sweet acacia tree. We just let it go because it's just so beautiful. And also, you know, it was a great larval, larval source for the gulf fritillary butterflies. And it produces edible fruit. Um, this one isn't isn't quite as delicious as probably some of the others, but we still we munched on it a little bit. Now we have a collection of critters, and so you know with the plants you'll bring in the wildlife. Um, sometimes you bring in things like we've had we have possums and raccoons in our backyard, so you know they can get a little out of you know out of hand sometimes. The the raccoon we hear them sometimes in the corner just making a making a noise, racket and all that. And it's but it's entertainment. You know it's literally turn your TV off and go outside and listen to the wildlife in your backyard, it's, it's pretty, pretty intense. I mean, you know, daylight versus nighttime, you're gonna see and hear different things, which is pretty cool. Um, but here we have a honeybee, which is a non-native on the, the blueberry bloom, but uh, you also see uh, sweat bees or orchid bees on some of the blueberries, they really like those. And then 
Uh, to the right of that, we've got Gulf Riddler Caterpillar, which to me, that's, again, that looks like a piece of modern art. You know, it should be in, in, in at the Saatchi Gallery in New York, New York or something. Uh, it's just so surreal that that can turn into something so beautiful. You know, it's just that that dichotomy of nature sometimes. Um, to the right of that is a wood thrush, um, just doing what it does, kind of hiding in the thickets. And we have several in our garden that, that work their way along the shrub rows. And, and uh, now is a great time to bird watch in your garden. I don't know if you all have been out there, but the cardinals, blue jays, thrushes, woodpeckers all over the place. It's just amazing. And uh, we do have a family of screech owls that lives in the backyard too, which is kind of cool. So. Uh, and again, you know, leaving areas in your garden kind of free and clear of anything, I think is an important thing as well. This is just a bare patch of sand and there's a long bodied wasp which burrows into the ground. So it needs open spaces. So some of the pollinators, you can put plants in, you can do this and that. You have to do other things too. You have to create, look at the thicket that's around the thrush or bare patch there. You've got to do these little fine tuned details to allow more diversity into your landscapes. It's really, really important. Um, just do a little research. I, you know, you can Google these things. Um, it's great. That's a great resource. Uh, there's a lot of great information out there. FNPS is great information on their website as well. Please go check that out. Um, so I'll just go through some, some other identification slides. I, I do these on occasion whenever I give other lectures because it's just pretty handy. You throw a bunch of stuff up there, just general description of the plant. This is American Beauty Berry right here. The blooms, uh, blooms are just turning into the berries, which will turn that nice kind of purplish uh, color. It's fantastic. Again, the way it arranges the blooms, uh, in regular intervals, you know, at the, at the you know, uh, leaf junction. It's just fantastic. It's, it's literally like nature is, is an artist in a way. It um, gets to about eight or 12 feet tall. Um, the purple berries are wonderful for the birds. The leaves are kind of like have a pungent fragrance. And a lot of folks think, oh, yeah, they have mosquito repellent qualities. I get bitten all the time. So I don't know. I try it out whenever I'm out there and uh, give it a go. Um, this has a little bit of an effect, I think. I just like the smell of it too. Um, but this would be a great one for a mixed border or a woodland garden. Dwarf saltbush, I mentioned that a few times. Uh, it's a coastal plant. This is a great one. <clears throat> it just has that beautiful, dense foliage. Um, and then the bloom is very fragrant. It, it occurs in autumn. So uh, it's a fantastic plant for late season uh, blooms. And it's very adaptable. So again, one of those you can use in a, in a formal setting or more of a mixed border. It's about four to six feet tall, so not a very big one. And then, um, you know, pruning it really does help create that shape. So, um, look at the key. so this is a this is a good example of again very simple idea, um, but it has a very long lasting and, and solid effect. This is again right next to a golf course. This is right on uh, McMullen Booth. I drive, used to drive by it when I would go visit my dad. And you know, this is uh, Chichi Rodriguez Golf Course. And so they have these areas off the side of the fairways where you know they you know they don't have, they don't have anything that they're non-functional to them as a golf course other than the fact that they have to treat their stormwater because it's full of nutrients and full of fertilizers. So these types of ponds are great because they'll fill up. Um, the plant in here is a bulrush. They'll fill up uh, seasonally, and then that bulrush is just drawing those nutrients out of the out of the water. So it's a really great filtration plant. Um, I've read somewhere that juncus and that family of plants can actually take heavy metals out of, out of water. They, they plant it next to um, large industrial sites to draw those heavy, basically like trap the heavy metals, you know, and make them inert. But I love this. I love grasses like this, native grasses and aquatic grasses. Christmas berry, this is a fantastic plant. This is an, kind of related to the goji berry. Um, Similar, very similar to that, you know, uh, people call it Florida goji. I, I've never, uh, I've tasted it a few times. I've tasted good ones. I've tasted sour ones. So it's kind of, you know, and I, and I try to spit the seeds out too, because they can be a little, a little uh, spicy. Um, but it's a great semi-evergreen shrub, salt tolerant. Um, I saw this up at, uh, oh, where was that? I was up at Tarpon Springs at uh, one of the parks up there, county parks, right up, right in amongst the mangroves. And so this is growing right up into the edge of salt water, um, gets to about eight or 10 feet tall. Typically, I think I've seen it 15 feet, I've seen it five feet. You know, it really depends on where, where it is. If it's in a re regular garden or a, a home garden, it's maybe gonna be five or six feet tall. 
uh, with pruning and whatnot. So you can keep it a lot lower, um, more manageable that way. But my cat birds just love getting in here and just you know rooting around for you know insects, berries. They'll they'll take Spanish moss off of it. It's just a fantastic uh, again kind of more sculptural type tree. I'll just sorry about that. Got on the turbo mode there. Georgia basil, another great edible. So this is one of those that's uh, low growing, goes to about one or two feet tall and uh, very aromatic. So very has a very strong mint uh, fragrance to it. Um, I like it along the edge of pathways and it's one of those that uh, it blooms uh, pretty much continuously throughout the year. So you can plant it with uh, scrub rosemaries and plants like that and uh, just bring a little bit of that you know, feature into your, into your landscape. But makes a great tea as well. Next plant is one of my favorites, and uh, I just like you know like plants that you know have multi multi purpose interest or multi interest. This is one of those. You know the foliage itself you know has a little bit of variation in the color. Typically mostly evergreen, but it occasionally has you know yellows and, and whatnot in some of the foliage. But look at those beautiful beautiful berries. This is just fantastic. And the blooms are very, very fragrant. So putting this next to a shady patio or along the edge of a walkway just would bring an incredible amount of fragrance and feature to your, to your landscape. And then also that you'd see these uh, beautiful berries. It's that wonderful multicolor aspect is just uh, fantastic. So here's the beach creeper. Um, this is the bloom, close to the bloom. Really pretty. Those blooms are maybe half an inch, three quarters of an inch long. So not very big. But, you know, just a wonderful sculptural look. And again, just very shapeable, very, you know, adaptable in terms of how you use it in the landscape. Can take a little bit of shade, but not too much. I like it in full sun, so very important. So this is a project we uh, did recently at the GE Aviation Building. This is right out in front of their, their office. And they were really passionate about using native plants. Um, they've got a couple of great cabbage palms there, and they're planning on doing the entire uh, landscaping around their building with native plants. So cool. I mean, just awesome. And so this is right on the uh, sidewalk right here, and just it's a dune sunflower that just has rambled and, and scrambled all over the, the area. But that's kind of the plan, you know, knowing what a plant will do is really key to like letting, you know, letting it do its thing, but also not... Uh, causing a problem down the road. If I put this in an area that was going to basically overgrow that pathway or it would just get too big, then it would be a maintenance nightmare. But this is done in a way that they literally just have to maintain that front edge and then the rest of it just grows and, and fills back to the building. So they're very pleased with it. And so, so am I. I mean, just love the way it looks. Um, it's coastal, salt tolerance. See this in the, sec in the dunes. Uh, if you go to any beach in the area, you'll see it um, kind of in the, over, over uh, in the walkways just to the left and right there. But, just fantastic, uh, sh sunny, showy plant. Yeah, wonderful. Getting down to it here. This is the uh, lopsided Indian grass. Again, you know, characteristics of some of these plants are just so interesting and unique. You know, this plant, uh, bunching uh, self seeding grass, it gets about six feet tall, um, but it kind of leans over, especially as we get this, the winds and the hurricane season comes on. It'll lean over more and more. But all those seeds will just kind of, you know, eventually scatter into the landscape and just give you more and more over time. Um, also a great food source for, for a lot of songbirds that love to eat grass seeds. So putting grasses in your garden is a good way to, to uh, feed uh, your, your bird population as well. Not to mention the fact that some, uh, some butterfly species do larval host on grasses, you know, blue stem grass in particular, some of the skippers on, on larval host on those. But it's a great textural companion for other plants, liatris and other wildflowers too. So. I like it by itself. It just looks pretty cool. Just like that. One of my all-time favorites. Uh, absolutely love this plant. And uh, if you're from Florida or come to Florida, palm trees are are it. You know, it's it's probably what we identify as the most Florida-like plant. And this is a cool one because it has a, a unique uh, foliage. This is the uh, silver salt palmetto. Gets to about 12 feet tall at its maximum size, but it can kind of flop over and fall over and maybe be more in the seven or eight foot range. Ours are about seven foot right now. I don't think they're gonna get much taller than that. But, um, great for uh, mixed hedges, uh, very drought tolerant once established. Also salt tolerant, so good for the coastal garden. Um, very sweetly fragrant flowers and, and dark fruit, great habitat uh, type plant. But also that texture is, is very uh, architectural too, so. Mm -hmm. 
uh, cinnamon bark. Love this plant. This is probably, again, called a lot of these plants my favorites, but you know, a lot of them have characteristics that when I think about them or interact with them, they become my favorites. So it's it's literally a situation of, you know, what's my favorite plant today? You know, I, I <laughs> it's hard to hard to pick just one, but this is an incredible uh, uh, plant, fairly slow growing. Um, the bark, the inner bark is edible, but the outer bark is, is kind of toxic. So definitely research your plants when you're doing anything with edible landscaping or edible plants. Uh, very drought tolerant once established, another salt tolerant species. Those beautiful orange flowers, just kind of like our, our version of fireworks here, uh, right around this time of year too. So right around the 4th of July, um, just again, can also bring in the Shelsa's swallowtail butterfly. That's a little more of a Southern species, but you know, we're, we are planting this up in our area. So you might see that butterfly. Buttonbush, uh, I mentioned this a few, uh, several times. And so um, again, just, you know, the character and quality of these plants, it's hard to talk enough about them, but just look at that beautiful bloom. And then that funny little stink bug up there, you know, it's just, uh, just my comic relief, I guess. You know, when I look at things like this, I have a little chuckle. But it also brings in a lot of other pollinators. Butterflies absolutely love this. Spicebush swallowtail used to love this plant uh, to, to nectar on. But it's great because you can use this in a dry location or a wet location. So good for the rain garden or good for you know the average garden soils um, with a little bit of irrigation. And it gets to about eight or 15 feet tall. If you go up to Brooker Creek Reserve, you'll see this a lot through the wetland areas. It's just awesome to see, especially when it's in full bloom. So. And that brings me to the end, and I thank you very much. And I hope I was entertaining. Um, first question is, how would you treat the weeds in the stone gravel creek bed? And I believe this was in reference to the, uh, the Gulf Force dry creek bed. You would yeah, show. yeah. So, so in those situations, um, putting some kind of an underlayment underneath, uh, you know, um, all the gravel that you put down is probably one of the one of the first things you would do. And you can also, uh, there's a technique that I've used where I use uh, pine straw underneath the stone as a mulch layer. And so that actually works pretty well too. And it helps stabilize the soils. Um, hand pulling is really, really the key. You know, anything that gets in there, hand pulling, um, I know it's labor intensive, but it's really, really one of the best ways to do that. We also have uh, vinegar as, a, as an alternative to use as an herbicide. And then, you know, I know if this, is, this was on a golf course, so I'm sure they're using herbicide uh, in that area. Um, but whenever you use herbicides, it's important, you know, to, to use it in uh, the right amounts and not use uh, things that don't belong next to what bodies of water. So reading labels is really important. Um, but I, I just can't, you know, say enough about, you know, the hand pulling. I do that a lot in my own gardens that I build. I still do a lot of hand maintenance. Um, and it's just, it's, it's a way to get ahead of the seed cycle and, and break that cycle, I think. So. Very cool. Um, another question, what size water garden or fountain triggers the need for a building permit? Did you know? Um, typically in residential areas, it really depends on your municipality and you really just have to go through your building codes, your local building codes and go, go that way. I know that HOAs are going to have restrictions on what you can do in those types of situations. And again, it's in the bylaws of wherever you're living. Um, but you know your municipality is 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 a, the best resource for that because it's different everywhere, uh, from Clearwater to Largo to Dunedin. Everyone has a little bit slightly different approach to it. <laughs> for the one that I did in the residential area, we didn't get a building permit for that, um, but it's a small scale, so it's more of a scale. I would say I'm when it goes larger, complaining for fun. You can swim in. That's when you might need to pull a permit on something like that, or it's you know more of a safety measure. Oh, James Comey and Andrew McCabe. Uh, another question: How do you keep the pine straw or mulch We're both subjected uh, to rare intensive burn, IRS uh, audits from the berm onto the sidewalk during a hard rain? I believe that was the flip my forty yard. It really it, is. It's a good question, and it's something that you know we, we exactly. always talk about edges in our landscapes, and so when you're bringing plants up to not only the point of getting on uh, the sidewalk, what we did is we excavated down about three inches and right at the curb they do, uh, and pulled that soil back up the hill. And then, then the mulch million basically million is trapped by the curb, so it basically acts as a stopper. Like um, that's a really effective way to do it. And you can do that with sidewalks at your house, house or so sidewalks in the street, etc. But I think, you know, that is a really good question. It's still not over because on for retaining those types of things, every receipt, every
Okay. Um, if anyone on Zoom has any uh, other questions, I'm getting a lot of uh, thank you for the presentation. Good presentation. Cheers. Um, thank you. Anyone here in our live audience, did anyone have any questions for Arnie before we take a break? Uh, yes, woman I don't know in the center there. <laughs> And if you could repeat the question. Sorry. Say it again. Uh, do I consult on existing ponds? And, you know, if it's a if it's a water feature pond, I do. There are uh, plenty of other consulting um, uh, businesses that do like large scale ponds and that kind of thing. But for a small for a small like yeah for residential pond, yeah, I would consider doing that. You know, consultation fees is uh, ninety five dollars. You know, but it's it basically is. Pretty inclusive of a lot of good information and troubleshooting and that kind of thing. Um, and uh, yeah, be happy to do something like that. There was a question in the back. Yeah, so the question is, she she has a uh, she lives in a house and next door, a uh, newer house went in and they built it up higher than her house. And I see this a lot um, in in a number of different areas, and it's it's kind of unfortunate because then it creates almost a ponding effect in your yard, whereas before. The water might have been distributed evenly amongst the properties and been able to soak in a little bit better. Um, she's trying to stop the flow or slow the flow of water uh, or slow it down a little bit as it goes through the property. I think the, the biggest thing would be to like figure out some way to create a staged series of um, you know collecting areas. So almost like a cascade. If you have a sloped yard, it's it's easier to do that on because you could you could literally create a, like a the Berman swale idea and have a series of those. If you can't do something like that, then you know using logs or or boulders, you know, as a way to kind of slow things down, and then a heavy mulch, like heavy pine straw. I always, you know, when I would do stormwater projects up north, you know, we had really, really, you know, the mountains would just, you know, let it come down, and we had to figure out ways to slow the water down. So we would jam logs into the banks. We would jam bays of hail into the banks too, and then really heavy mulch. It would get washed out, but then you would look where the energy was figure out where that high energy point was and try to slow that down with more materials. So it's going to be a process of trial and error. So we're trying to figure that out. Plants are a great, great way to do that. The bald cypress would be a great tree to put in the way that would help soak some of the moisture up. River birch, uh, the button bush you know, would be a great one. Grasses are great. You know, the Fakahatchee grass. We just did a project where we have a very strong slope that goes to a kind of a coastal, um, um, what is that called? It's literally just like a, a, you know a what you know a marsh, and so that slope is about 15 degrees. And we just put Fakahatchee grass on that because it'll slow down the water, and it also just is a pretty pretty feature too. But that would be a good solution. Yeah. Very good. No, nope. um, I've got uh, just a couple more questions for you. Okay. One of them is uh, what can be done to help make uh, using stone in a landscape more hurricane friendly? Yeah. So uh, that's really kind of a yeah. It's important. The size of your aggregate or stone is is uh, is one of those things that could become a projectile. It's definitely a thing we think about. Even with shell, you know, coastal shell, we use that in our landscapes. It does get blown around in, in our heavy storms. Um, the larger the size, the less likely it is to get picked up and, and hurled around. So that's really the, the main thing that you would consider, especially if you're in a mo more open lot. Our backyard is very densely planted, so the winds that do come in there don't really get to pick anything up. So the more dense, densely planted your landscape is, the less you have to think, I think you have to worry about that. But if it's a more open landscape, I would consider using larger stone uh, that's not going to get picked up. And, yeah, so so the, uh, the question was, was kind of like, uh, it's similar to what the earlier question was about the stormwater, but literally she uh, has a pond that's been created in her garden uh, or yard area by development just that's upstream from her. So it's almost like a wetland was created in, in her property uh, through that that development and that you know uh, channeling of stormwater. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like one of those things, it's, it's almost impossible to, to get it out of there because there's no place for it to go. It's that lowest, it's gonna seek the lowest point and obviously it's in that area. The larger the tree, the more it's gonna soak up. So bald cypress, I would say, get something, some couple of big plants in there that can really do. Yeah. Bald cypress is fantastic. You got, 
it, it does. It's a very narrow tree, though. It's it's probably one of the better, you know, more manageable trees for a, a residential garden. And it's a beautiful tree. It smells incredible. It has a wonderful fragrance. So I highly recommend bald cypress. So his his question is: there's there's a seam of clay, and then you get that. And I think Florida is all sand. It's not all sand. There are there are uh, areas where we have uh, clay substrates uh, that that does. Uh, you know, stop and, and retain water or create ponding areas, kind of like the earlier question. So plants that love those types of conditions are, you know, plants like um, uh, uh, rattlesnake master, the swamp rattlesnake master. That's probably one of my favorite uh, recommendations for that because it's a beautiful bloom. It loves marly, thick, you know, dense soils. Uh, button bush is another good one for that. Um, you can always, you know, the, the way to kind of like utilize plants in those areas is maybe don't plant them so low, plant them with a little bit of a raised area around them, add a little organics around them, so that they're almost like an island in the pond. And so then you you allow them a little breathing space so they're not, you know, all the way down in, in the low part of the swamp. Uh, other things like juncus. Juncus is a great plant for that, any of those type. Bacahatchee grass will probably do pretty well there. Yeah. Yeah, so things things of that nature. Um, iris, you know, the, the, the blue flag iris would be another good one. Um, uh, yeah, scarlet uh, hibiscus would probably be a good one for that. So any of the musky. It doesn't stay wet all the time. It's yeah. like it's on a slope. So yeah. what happens is the water will run down on top of the clay. Yeah. It'll be wet for a while, but then it's not very deep. Then yeah. it dries up. Yeah. It'll yeah. dry. If you wanted to create a little mini wetland in that area, you definitely could. You could kind of carve out a little dish or a, a bowl in there and put a few of those plants into that. I think it would, would really work for you because it'll resist that tendency for the water to percolate. The question was, uh, how do you tell the difference between the, the blue mist flower that's native and the one that's the non-natives? Um, the, one, the ones that I use, typically I buy them from reputable nurseries like Wilcox. So I know it's coming from a good source that is, you know, you know, you know, vetted all their stock. So again, you know, plant identification websites are great. There's probably a lot of resources on Facebook. Just go to one of those. You'll get a, yeah, it's good to know. It's good to know, you know, we, we Dave and I were looking at some of the plants in the in the swale out here earlier, just like marveling at all the non-native stuff in there. <laughs> just amazing. It's just like, where's the native plant? I, I can't see one in there. And, you know, it's just, it's just mind boggling. But then you come to a beautiful facility like Moccasin Lake and it's just wonderfully landscaped and taken care of. And this is this would be a great place to come and visit and uh, educate yourself about native plants and, and uh, butterfly gardening and everything else. So I thank you for the opportunity to talk to you and hope I wasn't too boring. <laughs>